So as Jen mentioned, my name is Madeline Bakuzi, and I'm here with Shivam Punjab. We are students in Dr. So's Global Health, or, uh, Design and Innovation for Global Health course, and we are just delighted to be introducing today, or this afternoon's session, integrating the base of the pyramid into the innovation process. We think that this session is going to be an excellent transition from this morning's very illustrious speakers to this afternoon and this evening's breakout panels, which will be very, um, as Dr. So mentioned this morning, problem smashing and really address specific problems um, for that the Duke community faces in the larger global health world. Now to get started, we wanted to give you a little bit of an, introdu an introduction about what the base of the pyramid means and what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. We wanted to start off with this quote from Bunker Roy, founder of the Barefoot College, which at its core is truly a base of the pyramid initiative. He said, but then I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills that very poor people have, which are never brought into the mainstream, which are never identified, respected, or applied on a large scale. And we think this really encapsulates many of the major issues that, that the BOP faces with the innovation process. We know that very poor people have immense insights into what products and innovations could make their lives easier and better, yet their input is not always incorporated into development strategies and market decisions. But when we speak about the, the base of the pyramid, who are we actually speaking about? There are 2.6 billion people at the base of the social and economic pyramid. This population is typically broken into two separate populations, those who are subsistent and those who live in extreme poverty. About 1.6 billion people live in subsistence, which translates to living on less than $3 per day. They're usually poorly educated and work in low-skilled jobs where earnings are usually not stable. Many need improved sanitation, better health care, and better access to education. And as both consumers and producers, subsistence populations conduct transactions in informal markets which have high levels of activity, but are often inefficient because they lack infrastructure and supportive institutions that back their activities. Subsistence populations also usually lack bank accounts and access to formal credit, and must turn to money lenders to, at loans for exorbitant rates, which leaves them extremely vulnerable to exploitation. Subsistence, farmer, or, sorry, subsistence populations uh, need access to gainful employment and the opportunity to purchase inexpensive items for day-to-day -day living that they both want and need. Now, extreme poverty is classified as living on less than $1 per day and is what we usually talk about when we refer to the bottom billion in popular health and economic literature. Um, people living in extreme poverty lack basic necessities such as sufficient food, clean water, and adequate shelter. War, civil strife, and natural disasters have displaced them from their homes and their families, forcing them to start their lives over, often in unfamiliar places with unfamiliar people. Some live in barter economies, others are bonded laborers, and they all participate in this informal market that again lacks the, in the formal infrastructure and organization. Water insecurities, poor health, and lack of nutrition plague their daily lives, and, and financial vulnerability Limited education and a dearth of marketable skills keep them out of organize, keep them out of organized economy and high-paying jobs. The lucky ones receive aid from nonprofit and international organizations or government relief programs. Now, both subsistent populations and those living in extreme poverty typically live in what we deem the global south. This is what we normally consider to be developing or low and middle-income countries, but the terminology global south and Global North is a new way of defining the relationship between what have typically been, been deemed aid-giving and aid-receiving countries. Now, why is the BOP important? Why are we talking about that today? Why do we have a whole session dedicated to the base of the pyramid? The BOP usually do not partake in formal markets, as I mentioned, but they represent a $5 trillion a year market, and the health market alone for the BOP is valued at around $90 billion per year. A market-based approach to poverty reduction recognizes that being poor does not eliminate commerce and market process, but rather focuses on the poor as consumers and producers to make, the mar to make markets more efficient and competitive. Multinational corporations are starting to pick up on this and are tapping into the BOP market through innovative products and are recognizing that producing for the BOP means fostering development and localized value creation. Now these concepts are not new, and they're certainly not new today. We've seen them peppered throughout this morning's sessions, and certainly Jen and Chris's. 
At Mickey Chopra's wonderful introduction to the symposia, he discussed the need for incorporating feedback from mothers about oral rehydration salts, such as adding taste and improving package, packaging for the salts to increase uptake and ultimately reduce childhood deaths due to diarrhea. Bernard Munoz and Josh Summer echoed, uh, and Bernard, I'm sorry, Bernard Munoz, which Josh Summer echoed, said that, the, the, um, said that you need to solve problems by handing it over to the youth. And I think we would argue that taking that even further, we would hand it over to the BOP to really solve a lot of the world's problems. Judith said that we live in a time of tremendous opportunity, but we need new models for innovation. And this afternoon's panel will certainly discuss those indeed. Josh Summer, R.T. Ryan, and Rachel Cohn spoke about the need to dissect technologies and seek out unique problem solvers for today's hardest problems. And specifically, specifically, we need to target technologies for the bottom of the pyramid first and foremost. And our own colleagues, Jennifer Radcliffe and Chris DeBoer, spoke about innovations that directly target base of the pyramid innovations and produce products that are directly relevant for this population. So you can see, these issues are really quite relevant, quite relevant, I'm sorry, <laughs> pertinent. Um, and we're hoping this afternoon's <laughs> session um, can really codify a lot of the issues that we've talked about and serve as a bridge to this afternoon's problem smashing sessions. So now I'm going to hand it over to Shivam to talk a little bit more about why BOP innovation is vital and also to introduce this afternoon's speakers. Thank you, Madeline. <clears throat> Now I want to take a moment to really understand what it means to understand the base of the pyramid. By understanding, I'm not necessarily referring to the numbers, the political or legal or economic framework that characterize the bottom building. Understanding them to me means that we hear their stories, learn about their values, and engage in dialogue to see how they best envision productivity and efficiency in the parameters of their own lives. When conceptualizing innovation for the poor, this level of understanding becomes extremely important. For multinational corporations and entrepreneurs to cater to the base of the pyramid market effectively, <coughs> understanding can be broken down into two components, understanding their needs and understanding their wants. Understanding their needs is often done through the lenses of external actors, when we look at what we think they need and by looking at their visible disparities. Arguably, innovators would even go further and say, that they are presuming that these technologies are adhering to the local context, logistics, and cultural norms. However, this may be very different from the wants of the poor. When, when what they may want is something that we cannot see. It's something, perhaps an idea, that hasn't made it out into the mainstream. It could be an idea that they embody, as Bunker Roy notes in an opening quote. They may know what type of innovation can best impact and serve their communities. Unless organizations and entrepreneurs tap into this knowledge bank, the innovations may fail to be fruitful or accepted. This leads us to the friction point, where what external actors consider to be the needs of the poor are misaligned with their wants. Base of the pyramid consumers may not want the innovations that they are presenting. A consequence of this misalignment would be the inability for multinationals to commercialize and scale their innovations. More severely, this misalignment could even lead to innovations doing more harm than good in the field. This analysis, this analysis is a simplification of the work of two very prominent academics in the field, Ted London and Stuart Hyatt. Ted London is a senior research fellow and director of the Base of the Pyramid Initiative at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Stuart Hyatt is the S.T. Johnson Chair in Sustainable Global Enterprise at the Johnson School of Management at Cornell University. Together in their research, they advocate that multinational corp managers and academics must move beyond the imperialist mindset that everyone must want and look want, must want to look and act like Westerners. Furthermore, they go on to state that the expected behaviors in these segments are typically modeled after Western values and lifestyles. In some, emerging economies should not be viewed as a homogenous pattern of economic development in which our markets are evolve, evolving towards a more Western style consumer base. Therefore, in order for multinationals to overcome this limitation, successful ventures identified and leveraged strengths in the existing environment and included collaborating with non-traditional partners, co-inventing custom solutions, and building local capacity. Such collaboration has ensured 
that entry into low-income markets at the base of the pyramid indeed benefited multinational corporations from identifying local partners who could actively contribute to venture conceptualization by adding local content to the product design. The research, in Hutt, the research of Hutt in London has introduced a different framework of thinking in which a multinational corporation can look into the base of the pyramid market and engage it actively to create products and innovation that not only the poor need but also want. And today we have with us two very special guests who help organizations and entrepreneurs do exactly that. They, un they help organizations and entrepreneurs better understand the base of the pyramid market so that the work that they do, the technologies that they innovate, can be implemented in, de in the developing world. We have with us today Kevin Hong and Karina Megan of Root Alliance. I met with I met Karina and Kevin earlier this year at Harvard and was inspired by the education and knowledge that they shared with us there. Kevin is a managing director and a co-founder of Ruth Alliance. He pursued his graduate work at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University after studying computational and system biology at Cornell University. Kevin has worked in over seven different countries for over six different years um, by managing partnerships with local organizations such as the Carter Center, Carter Center in Ethiopia and Irwin Eye Hospital. He has worked extensively as a study coordinator of international Random, random controlled trial on neglected eye diseases with the Proctor Foundation at UCSF. And Kevin has also worked with innovative firms such as Trickle Up and Innovation for Poverty Action. Thank you, Kevin, for being with us today. Our second guest is Karina Nagan, the Director of Operations in India and also a co-founder of Root Alliance. Karina graduated from Pitcher College and studied intercultural studies, and then went on to also obtain a master's at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He is an award-winning social entrepreneur who has done work with the social enterprises <coughs> in US, Indonesia, and India. She has focused on community organizing, product implementation, and operations management. Karina helped launch green print technologies in 2006 and monitored their sales to Fortune 500 companies in Bangalore, India. He soon became its operations manager. He has also done work in the water sector um, at the base of the pyramid in Rajasthan, India. Thank you, Karina, also for being here with us today. We are extremely excited and we really hope to learn from the different experiences that Kevin and Karina bring with them. And please now join me in welcoming Kevin and Karina. I think we're all a little bit kind of dazed from the lunch still. <laughs> so yeah, we want to play us out, but oh well, we're going to do something really fun. Um, so we, um, as we were introduced nicely by the panel, um, by the great students at Duke, uh, we are representing Root Alliance. Uh, and before we get started, I, um, I want to kind of understand who is in the room. So I want to, I want you to at, uh, raise your hand if you're students. Uh, at Duke or any other places. UNC. <laughs> yeah, anywhere. <laughs> students. Okay, great. So about half, more, a little bit more than half. And how many of you have experienced working or living in developing countries? And that requires more than like, oh, I was back in three or four weeks. It requires a lot more. <laughs> okay, perfect. So a lot of you have actually working on, experienced working on the ground. Um, so, uh, one thing I want to mention is that there is a lot of knowledge and experience and insight in the room, uh, and we, we are by no means the expert in this field. So, I want you to chime in anytime and share in the insight and wisdom you have from your experience with us uh, and with the room. As so, well. like the title of our, our presentation, Integrating the Base of the Pyramid in the Innovation Process, we want to integrate you into our workshop, so hopefully this will be uh, very hands-on and collaborative. And uh, as interactive as possible. Uh, last question that I want to ask you is, is there anyone who is working on a particular idea or social ventures um, right now? Okay, great. So there's a few, okay, perfect. So I might rope you into the conversation at some point as well. Um, great, so I think there's a really, uh, there's a really good mix, uh, mix in the audience and I'm really, we are really excited to lead this workshop. Uh, which is talking about integrating base of the pyramid or the BOP into the innovation process. And this principle applies to any type of social innovation, not just health. But we try to make it as health-focused as possible for this conference. 
Um, so we'll try to um, use some of the case studies uh, in this field to talk about some of the best or not so best practices uh, and why, why is it so important to integrate BOP into your processes and how to go about it, what's the best way, some of the best way to do um, to uh, mobilize and communicate with the base of pyramid in the, in the process. Um, so, and, oh, I, on, another thing that I want to mention is that there's really no one right way to do it. And this workshop was not intended to say this is the only way you should go about it. It's more to give you, when you walk out this workshop, I want, we wanted to give you some food for thought or the frame of mind to keep, uh, for you to keep when you're thinking through these processes. Um, so, okay, great. So to begin the workshop, we're going to just tell you a little bit about what we do at Root Alliance. So Root Alliance, we connect social ventures with the local grassroots and non-governmental organizations to conduct uh, market, uh, community-based mar um, market research and product testing in the community so that you can really understand what's going on, on the ground, what is the local context, what do people really want, what do people actually are going to use so that so that so to help you really understand and to make your product and services really impactful in this space of the pyramid. Um, one point that I want to use uh, to start off the workshop is from Ishwar Patel. Uh, Ishwar Patel, who passed away uh, two years ago in 2010, uh, was an activist. Really worked on the issue of um, the untouchable. Uh, or the lowest caste in India, and he worked uh, incessantly on the issue of sanitation, and he developed locally your preferred toilets and built over 200,000 toilets in India, especially targeting towards the lowest caste. And he said, to build toilet is easy, but to shift people's mind and heart is the way of work. Software is more important than hardware. So it really is, is talking about Developing a tech like technology as a part of the um, innovation process is the easier part. The difficult part is really trying to understand people's mind and heart so that this technology actually makes sense in their mind, in their heart, so they can actually use this technology so they can benefit from it. And that's really the difficult part of this whole process of innovation. And that's what we're going to actually cover. So as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, we are going to have um, kind of three big case studies, um, and one case study we're going to show you a video, uh, actually two video videos about this particular innovation, and we're going to talk about what happened. And the second case study we're going to actually uh, send uh, give you a, a paper uh, is talking about this particular innovation, another innovation. So we're going to take some time to read it and talk about what happened and how we could have done things differently. And we'll or, do small group discussions, so we'll get to move around a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have first, we'll give you time to read it and then break into small group discussion and then we group as a um, group, as a whole room um, to talk about it. And then last, we're gonna have a very mini case study to talk about what, what we mean by innovation. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So how many of you in this room heard about a pro uh, project called La um, Play Pump? So a few of them, okay, this is a pretty good number. Um, so actually, can one of you tell me what it is? It is, um, it mimics a playground toy in the States and kids are encouraged to play with it and it actually pumps them up so it brings water to populations that don't. Yeah. Have an accessible time. Exactly. So as you can see, I mean, when you say it, it's kind of intuitive, right? Like, there are, kids are playing on the merry round and the kinetic energy of, of people playing, pushing the um, pushing the merry round pumps the groundwater to increase access to clean water. So it's really an idea of harnessing the kinetic energy of kids who just seem to have endless energy <laughs> and using that to kind of replace the handheld pump, uh, like a hand pump. Uh, in developing countries, and they introduced kind of ingenious scheme to uh, kind of add advertisement to the water tower to generate revenue to cover maintenance cost. So it's, it sounds a pretty sexy idea, right? Uh, so we're gonna send, uh, we're gonna show you uh, a video. Let's see if you can find it. Oh, sorry. So wow, the 
that's funny. It's way worse when you're at a technology conference when they're talking about technology at the yeah, base of the pyramid and you can't even get the technology to work. <laughs> <laughs> In many parts of the world, it is impossible. He took me to these women are when they should be beasts of burden. Hi, guys. Hello. How are you doing? Trevor's an entrepreneur who made his money in the advertising business. And at the age of 42, decided he wanted to give something back. He teamed up with an inventor, and the roundabout outdoor play pump was born. Yeah, so what happens is as the kids, as the kids spin here, uh, and it doesn't matter which direction they go, it works in both directions. Water's pumped from an underground borehole, comes across here underground into this pipe, and not only can you hear the water going into the pipe, but you can actually feel that it's yeah. getting very cold, cold now. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, there's an outlet pipe, and it goes across to that tap. It, when you turn it on, you just get cold, clean, fresh drinking water coming out of it. The play pump costs only $7,000 to install and can pump up to 400 gallons an hour. Trevor installs most play pumps at schools where jungle gyms and swing sets are rare. The principal says it's a hit. First time in, when they arrive at school in the morning, the first child who comes in goes to the wheel, dumps his book or a book and comes to the wheel until the bank bell rings. They enjoy playing here. <laughs> I feel so impressed and I appreciate it. And me and my friends were just running. Even though the teacher called us, we didn't listen to him. We <laughs> just ran into the miracle one. There were no toys at school that we could play with, so I thought this miracle one, we could play with it and, and, and have some fun. And what? Some fun. <laughs> it's fun, and the water's better, too. So this used to be your drinking supply? Yes. This is where you drink water from? Okay. Yes. So what do we have here? Patricia Mahole, a teacher, says for years they never realized the groundwater here was polluted. We thought it was safe, but the kids used to get diarrhea, you see, and vomit, get sick. The play pump changed everything by drawing clean water from deep underground. Trevor sells ad space on the water tanks and uses the money for maintenance to keep the play pumps working. And then he had another idea. What is this? Well, this is a, uh, the Love Life campaign. This is an HIV AIDS awareness campaign. This is a focal point of the community. So my idea was that if we put, if we put messages for HIV AIDS awareness, it should have the same effect on these kids. And we've got to get the message through to them before they become sexually active. That's the way I see it. Trevor invited us along as a new play pump was installed in the eastern... So actually, I'm going to pause there. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of interesting idea. And they were actually, they attracted a lot of attention and funding. Uh, in 2006, they were featured at Clinton Global Initiative. And also, they raised uh, over $16 million funding to scale this up all over in South Southern Africa. And Jay-Z put together a benefit concert and raised funding for them. It was a really cool project. It was a really hot project. So um, interesting idea. I mean, as Dr. Chopra uh, mentioned earlier, uh, diarrhea is one of the leading cause of death, especially among children. So if you can just get this clean water to people, maybe we can cut all of this unnecessary death. Um, so following up, we're going to actually show you um, a video of a play pump project uh, put together by the same journalist about two years after uh, this uh, video was released. Uh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> 
Tonight on Frontline World, three stories from a small planet. First in Southern Africa, it was supposed to harness the energy of children to bring fresh water to their villages. Now, five years later, this play pump hasn't produced any water for six months. What happened with the play pump? Frontline World correspondent Amy Costello investigates a story of how trying to do good can sometimes go wrong. We would all love there to be a magic bullet. That's not the way it worked. Okay, so that's kind of obvious. Like, what just happened? <laughs> okay, so I want to kind of ask you, what do you think happened with the play pump? Kind of give me some guesses if you don't already know the answer. Yeah. Um, I, I know a similar anecdote where it took a ritual away from the village women, who uh, that was their only social time they had during the day was to go out and collect water. It took a few hours to make the journey. And so the village allowed that uh, pump to fail because it was, it was disruptive in negative ways. Mm. That's interesting work. Yeah. Um, because you could put them, I mean, you know, once you've got thousands of them to install, uh, you're not going to be so choosy in where you put them. And you put them in, uh, you know, less favorable sites uh, and the end of failing. Mm -hmm. um, sure, let's go from back to the um, Didn't have the tools of the expertise to maintain them over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maintenance. I would follow up with that maintenance comment that if you're relying on advertising dollars, targeted at kids, but the, the advertisers aren't sure that their advertising is generating the ROI that they want, then the advertising dollars can disappear and the maintenance is not, is not there. Yeah. Are you at the business school here? I actually just graduated, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. I was going to say, I mean, now that they have a steady supply of water, they're probably building up jerry can to try and sell them in, lo in other areas, maybe exhausting the supply of water mm. in whatever areas they're working in. Right. I mean, that's an issue with any type of water projects, right? Depleting groundwater. Um. Uh, to follow up on the location comment, um, just putting them in schools is great, but you also need them in, in other areas as well. And sometimes the areas where you put them may actually cause conflict because one one group is getting water and the other group is not. And so. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Sometimes they're overestimating that the children will be constantly playing on them. Some, you know, there are stories of women just mm -hmm. manually trying to just, you know, push the the pump around as much as they can, just because trying to get water wasn't, you know, completely working as people visualized it, like envisioned it would. Yeah. And I think I saw was... the same point. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think all of them are really yeah. great points, and they're all multiple points of um, kind of suspicion, right? Like, if this project can actually work on the ground. So let's actually find out what really happened. Five years ago, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. And by the School Foundation. By 2010, Hank above. As the rollout continued to get it done fast. A good idea. I'm back in Mozambique. I'd heard that the play pump rollout had run into trouble, and I wanted to see what had happened. This is the site I'd visited with Trevor Field on my last trip here. So we're back here at Antaka Primary School a few years after we first visited. And if we look over at what's happening at the play pump now, the children are just kind of standing idle. The boy pulls the lever, but no water comes out. You know so? The assistant principal tells me there's a problem. With no water in the tank, one group of children has to spin in order for others to drink. The play pump was supposed to be fun, but this looks like work. <laughs> and when the water finally comes, the kids battle over it. I decided to visit more play pump sites. The next one was in a more remote part of Mozambique, with not nearly as many children around. I'd heard this village used to get its water from a hand pump, 
But then some people arrived to install a play pump. When the play pump came, were you expecting it? Had anybody told you that we'd like to bring a play pump to this community? No, we didn't have any information. So we were on the shore, pedras, like that little tank, and then the secretary asked us to bring water to the well. Regina showed me how she managed to use the pump, which was designed for children. But she's young. You can't use it. Can you use it? No, no, no. And these women have a bigger problem. Regina says this play pump hasn't produced any water for six months. Trevor Field's plan to cover maintenance with revenue from billboards wasn't working here. And when the women called or texted the repair line, they told me they got no response. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. I met with Joaquin George. He's with Mozambique's Rural Water Authority. Once the pump breaks, and it will take more than three months to repair, people at least in the community no longer trust the repair pumps because they are demoralized. You know, it does not work properly. We know it is for free, but it does not work properly. So. I asked George about a report the government commissioned on the play pump that was never released. It was based on visits to more than 100 sites and detailed a long list of problems like the ones I'd found, the strange operation technique for women, pumps out of commission for up to 17 months, and maintenance a real disaster. Perhaps most concerning, they found children not really using the play pump in the way that it had been touted, something I'd seen for myself at Intaka Primary School. I wanted to talk about all of this with play pump founder Trevor Field but he was reluctant to speak. Then in Mozambique's capital, I met someone who would talk. Good question, and I'm not sure. John Grabowski said his group, Save the Children, worked with Trevor Field to install dozens of pumps in Mozambique, just before Grabowski became the group's country director. In December of 2007, all of the pumps were operational. Right now, there are only 13 that are operational? Of those 42. Why? Uh, I, again, they're just not operating. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know what's wrong with those pumps? Uh, te technologically, no. Um. The Mozambique government report in part blames Save the Children itself for not properly testing sites and the quality of water at those sites before play pumps were installed there. Then, later, Save the Children proved unable to resolve complaints from the field. You then begin to hear negative responses from the community. Do you know when you started to hear those negative responses? Um, actually, uh, pretty much right after installation. Again, if you look at the reports that we were submitting uh, back to Play Pumps, I mean... And uh, how did Play Pumps International respond to the feedback that you were giving them? <coughs> Good question, and I'm not sure I have an answer to that one. This is the Washington headquarters of the Case Foundation and Play Pumps International. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. So, I mean, it's really a lot of points they already brought up. Uh, I think you, you guys were quite perceptive about what really happened. So there is not only the issue of maintenance and advertising revenue was it realistic that you were gonna you know, to, um, generate enough revenue to support maintenance efforts, especially if it's really spread all across these remote areas, but also they really failed in a multiple points uh, from the beginning of the project to the implementation and um, maintenance of their uh, play pumps. They failed to notify the community and involve in a process of testing out the idea and actually implementing on the ground to really by understand where they're coming from, how, they cons how do they collect water, what kind of social dimension is there in collecting water, and how how this um, infrastructure is going to work in a local context and how it's going to be perceived and how it's going to be utilized. And they really didn't take that a lot of local um, context into, um, into the consideration when they're uh, developing this project. 
And that, that was really the failure of the project. I mean, it was technically a perfectly sound project, but not really understanding the local context. It's really, uh, it was really the kind of final blow. And that's why it, it's really a case showing that why is it so important to mobilize and communicate and collaborate with the base of the pyramid, the people we are trying to help uh, in developing country, and why is it so important to um, try to engage them and so that you can understand in what context are they operating, socially, economically, and politically, and what they really want, what they really need, how they behave, how do they think, what kind of superstitions or social norms apply to this kind of behaviors that you're trying to address. That is really critical. So, um, and one thing that I want to point out, hopefully the concept of engaging local communities, we're not blowing your mind with this. This is something that hopefully you're already thinking about and you're saying, yeah, of course I should engage local communities in any project that I'm working on. Um, I think that's widely accepted now. It ne ne wasn't necessarily you know, 20 years ago, but I think now you fill out any grant application, they want to know how are you going to engage with local communities. The challenge is, is that just going to be a checkbox that you do? Do you fly in on spring break, have a couple discussions, and then go home and speak, spend two years developing a product or innovation and not reconnecting? I think it's something that you have to integrate into the full process of both finding out what the needs actually are, developing your product, um, right down to testing your product and, and evaluating it. So it's, it's important to continue to think about it. Also, the fact is it's really hard. It's something that I struggle with with all of the field work I've done. Every time I go in, I, I have to remind myself um, that I have uh, preconceived notions that I have to fight and, and I, I have to make sure that I'm really reaching out and engaging with the community. Um, and as simple as it sounds, I think it's something that I constantly have to remind myself, um, remind myself of. So we're going to go into our second case study, um, kind of staying on the theme of water. How many of you guys have heard of Life Straw? Yay! How many of you guys have seen a life straw? <laughs> we brought a life straw. All right, great. Um, so we have some experts in the room. Um, so obviously we know the stats. There's close to a billion people who don't have access to clean water. This causes diarrhea. This is a bad thing. There's a need for purifying water. Uh, Vestergaard France and Company came up um, with this innovative solution. They said, you know, one of the challenges is people have ways to purify water in their homes sometimes, but then when they're out working in the fields, um, or away from their home, they don't have a way to purify their water there. So they created a straw, um, and it works just like a straw. You suck water in from the top, has a very simple filter in it, a uh, very effective filter. And you're able to put it directly into the water source, whether it's a lake, a river, um, or a glass of water, um, and it purifies the water as you suck it through. So um, I think what I would like to do is ask for a brave volunteer who feels like they need to be hydrated. Who loves it? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. We got a volunteer. Great volunteer. What was your name? Yudi. Yudi, come on up to the front. Round of applause for our volunteer. So I think one of the first and easiest ways to start getting feedback and engaging local communities is to actually get products into people's hands. You can ask them, and I can sit here and have a one-hour, one-on-one interview with you about what you think about my beautiful life straw, but I think having you use it is the best way to get feedback. So I'm going to give you the life straw. Let's get a glass of water, my lovely assistant. All right. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, really, we're going all out here. <laughs> Did I mention that the filter is very good? 99.99% of bacteria. 99.99% of bacteria. All right, so I'm going to give you the glass of water. Uh, yep, go ahead. Have, have a sip of water. Let's see how it works. Look another way. <laughs> yep, yeah, go get all in. All right. Go ahead, then. Pick it up. Okay. So, what are some, well, besides the fact that it's not working, which is one of the challenges, um, <laughs> Challenges is 
you have extremely dirty water. Uh, but another challenge is that, it, that they were finding is that it takes um, a lot of force to be able to get the water through here. So um, I'm, I'm going to mess up the exact stat, but I think uh, it takes about two minutes to actually drink. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.